Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. I'm Paul Nissenson from the Mechanical Engineering Department at Cal Poly Pomona. Over the years, many undergraduate engineering students and many high school students have asked me about graduate school. Some students have no idea what graduate school even is, while other students have a fairly good idea of what graduate school will be like and just want some advice on how to succeed there. So today, I'm going to be dedicating this episode to providing an overview of graduate school and talk about why you might want to consider attending graduate school after completing your bachelor's degree. Keep in mind that everything I discuss today is focused on engineering students who might be interested in pursuing graduate school in the U.S. While graduate school is available for many other disciplines at universities across the world, the requirements for completing graduate school can be very different between each discipline and may differ significantly between countries. So with that caveat in mind, let's get started. Before I can begin talking about graduate school, I would like to first discuss what it's like to earn an undergraduate or bachelor's degree, because students must first earn the bachelor's degree before even being allowed to pursue the graduate degree. If an undergraduate student is going to school full-time, which usually means taking at least four classes per semester, it will take a typical engineering student about four to six years to earn their bachelor's degree in their discipline. The exact amount of time will depend on the requirements of the engineering program, the number of courses taken per semester by the student, and the number of courses that need to be repeated due to failing a course, which happens occasionally. While pursuing a bachelor's degree, undergraduate students are required to take a wide range of engineering-related courses, as well as many courses that are not related to engineering at all. For example, in my department, Mechanical engineering students will take courses in thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, machine design, materials, control systems, engineering economics, computer programming, and so on. They also will take a lot of math courses and courses in communication and writing, the natural sciences, social sciences, and other areas to fulfill their general education, or GE, requirements. The goal of the undergraduate program is to expose students to many different ideas to hopefully make them well-rounded people and well-rounded engineers. Completing a wide range of engineering courses also allows students to get a better idea of what types of jobs they may want to pursue after college. Once a student obtains an undergraduate degree, they're eligible to join a graduate degree program. Most graduate programs will have requirements for GPA and the type of undergraduate degree obtained. Many of the students who go to graduate school will apply to graduate programs that are similar to their undergraduate programs. For example, a student may study mechanical engineering as an undergraduate and then apply to a mechanical engineering graduate program. But it's often possible to apply to a graduate program in a field that is different from your bachelor's degree. This actually happened to me. I obtained an undergraduate degree in physics, but I went to graduate school in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at UC Irvine. The application package for graduate school usually requires transcripts, a statement of purpose, and letters of recommendation from people at the student's undergraduate institution, usually professors the student has interacted with frequently. The letters of recommendation discuss the student's potential for succeeding in graduate level courses and for conducting research. Having research experience as an undergraduate student or at a job can definitely help a student's chances of being accepted into a graduate program. Students applying to graduate programs also may be required to take the Graduate Record Examination or GRE, which is a standardized test that has sections on verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, and analytical writing. Keep in mind that the requirements for entry into a graduate program can vary greatly between universities, 
So applicants should pay close attention to what is required for the institutions they are interested in joining. Now, once someone makes it into graduate school, which, by the way, is often called grad school for short, there are usually two degrees that can be pursued, a master's degree and a PhD, which is often called a doctorate. Both the master's and PhD will require completing coursework that is much more narrowly focused compared to undergraduate coursework. As an example, when I was in grad school, I mostly took courses in math, fluid dynamics, computer modeling, and atmospheric chemistry, and I didn't have to take general education courses or courses in other areas of mechanical engineering. The level of math skills required to do well in graduate courses is usually significantly higher than in undergraduate courses, and students will need to think about high-level abstract concepts much more frequently. I have a really strong memory of the first day of my first course, which was fluid dynamics. The professor started the course by discussing the most difficult topic from my undergraduate fluid mechanics course, which is the Navier-Stokes equations, and it only got more difficult from there. So now let's focus on the differences between what is required to obtain a master's degree and what's required to obtain a PhD. For completing a master's degree, uh, many institutions will have a choice between a thesis option and a comprehensive exam option. Both options will require a decent amount of coursework to be completed, uh, and if a student pursues the thesis option, they also will conduct research under the supervision of a faculty advisor. After completing the research, the student will submit a report to the department summarizing the research and may be required to give an oral presentation to a committee of faculty members who will ask questions about that research. If there is a comprehensive exam option, the student will be required to pass a written exam, oral exam, or possibly both, but there won't be a requirement to conduct research. For a typical student attending graduate school full-time, it usually takes one and a half to three years to complete a master's degree. Master's degrees can be completed part-time as well, and many students work full-time jobs while just taking one or two classes per term. And if a student who is working is lucky, their employer might even help pay the tuition for the master's program. Pursuing a PhD is a much larger commitment, usually taking four to six years and generally can't be done part-time. A PhD student will be required to take classes during their first year or two and then spend the rest of their time conducting research under the supervision of a faculty advisor. Faculty advisors are very busy people. They spend most of their time teaching courses, serving on various committees across campus, trying to secure funding by writing proposals, writing papers for publication in peer-reviewed journals, mentoring students and other researchers under their supervision, attending and organizing conferences, and many other tasks. They often don't have a lot of time to do the actual research and rely heavily on graduate students and other researchers to handle the numerous details involved in a research project. And as a result, graduate students often end up knowing more about their narrow field of study than their advisors by the time they get their degree. During their time in graduate school, PhD students will learn how to use the latest tools and ideas for conducting research. They gain a lot of experience writing papers for publication in peer-reviewed journals. They attend conferences where they can present their work and write grant proposals to try to obtain funding for their research. They also often will get the opportunity to be a teaching assistant, where they may be required to grade quizzes, tests, or lab reports. They might lead discussion sections or labs. And they might even be asked to be a guest lecturer when the instructor is out of town for a conference. Overall, PhD students are trained how to become a professional researcher and a college-level instructor. Before finally receiving that PhD, there are a few tests that graduate students must pass. The names of these tests 
may vary between universities. So I will use the names from my time as a graduate student at UC Irvine. The first test is called the Preliminary Examination, or Prelim Exam for short. And it's taken by students soon after completing their coursework, usually after the first year or so of starting the PhD program. In the prelim exam, students take a written or oral test, or perhaps both, to determine if they are competent enough to begin pursuing research in their field of study. If a student passes the prelim, at that point, the student shifts the focus from completing coursework to conducting research full-time. If a student fails the prelim exam a couple times, well, that student may be excused from the PhD program, but often will be given an opportunity to leave the university with at least a master's degree. The second test that a PhD student must pass is called the qualifying examination, or sometimes called QUALS for short. This exam is taken after the student has completed a significant amount of research and has a plan for their dissertation. And the dissertation is simply a written document, typically well over 100 pages in length, that summarizes all the research completed by the PhD student. The qualifying exam usually takes place within a couple years after completing the prelim exam. During the qualifying exam, the graduate student gives an oral presentation to a committee of faculty members, which will include the student's advisor. The student discusses their research proposal for the dissertation and explains why they are competent enough to successfully complete the proposal. If a student does not pass the qualifying exam, the exam committee will explain why and establish criteria that the student must meet prior to retaking the exam. When a student passes the qualifying exam, they move into the final phase of the PhD program where the research tends to become highly focused and often pushes the boundaries of what is currently known in that field of research. And before I get to the third and final test of a PhD student, I want to mention that many PhD students will get a master's degree sometime in the middle of their PhD program by writing up a master's thesis. Even though this takes some additional work, it's always a good idea to get that master's degree along the way, just in case the student needs to exit the PhD program for whatever reason. At least the student will have obtained a master's degree for all their hard work. Once a student has completed a sufficient amount of research, they're ready for that final test, the dissertation defense. Prior to the defense, the student will spend a lot of time, sometimes many months, writing the dissertation. This is a lengthy, highly technical document that would only be understood by experts in that particular field. When a solid draft of that dissertation is finished, the student will share the document with the dissertation defense committee, which often consists of the same faculty members that were on the student's qualifying exam committee. The committee members will provide feedback on the dissertation that the student will incorporate into a final draft of the dissertation. And if all goes well, they can proceed to holding the defense event. The dissertation defense is open to the public and consists of an oral presentation by the student, which usually lasts 30 to 60 minutes, followed by questions and comments from the committee members and possibly people in the audience. After a public comment period has ended, the dissertation committee will meet behind closed doors to determine whether the student has met their standards for obtaining the PhD. Now, although the defense might sound intimidating and full of drama, if the student has a good advisor, they will be well prepared for the defense and the atmosphere will generally be positive and supporting. Most defenses I've observed are more like a celebration than some nerve wracking experience and I have never personally known a PhD student to be rejected at this stage. I've heard it occasionally happens, but it's not very common. Students are usually weeded out much earlier on in the PhD program. Assuming the student's defense was successful, the student will have earned the title doctor and will be able to put the letters PhD after their name, which stands for Doctor of Philosophy. So since I successfully completed a PhD program back in 2009, 
I can officially refer to myself as Dr. Paul Nissenson or Paul Nissenson, PhD. I have a very clear memory of me pacing outside the conference room at the end of my own defense as I was awaiting the decision from the committee. At some point, my advisor emerged from the room with a smile on his face. He shook my hand and said, Congratulations, doctor. So now that you, hopefully, have a better idea of what graduate school is like, I'd like to discuss who should consider applying to graduate school. Many engineers can have good-paying, fulfilling careers with just a bachelor's degree. And for most engineers, having a master's degree also can be very beneficial. An engineer with a master's degree not only will have more advanced knowledge in that particular area of engineering, which potentially could make that person a more effective engineer, the master's degree usually will open doors to higher level positions within a company and definitely will make a resume more attractive. Having a master's degree also may allow someone to negotiate a higher salary, which is always nice. For most engineering jobs, having a PhD is fine, but probably not worth the years of extra effort. But there are certain jobs where having a PhD is almost certainly necessary. For example, nowadays a PhD is usually required to become a tenure-track faculty member at a university like me. For a community college, it may be possible to become a tenure-track faculty member with only a master's degree, but having a PhD is almost always going to be better. If someone is interested in just teaching at a university without worrying about getting tenure, it may be possible to become a lecturer with a master's degree or even a bachelor's degree sometimes. Just keep in mind, being a lecturer means possibly not having that long-term job security that comes with tenure. And by the way, if you don't know the differences between being a tenure-track faculty member and being a lecturer, you can check out episode 6 where I discuss the various titles and ranks an instructor can have. Another area where having a PhD may be necessary is when you want to conduct research at a university, at a government lab, or at a private company, especially if you want to be a lead on projects. If you go into a lab at a typical university that offers PhDs like UCLA or MIT, you likely will find many people with PhDs who focus solely on conducting research. So let's say a student knows that they want to go to graduate school. When should they consider applying and to which school should they apply? Well, after getting a bachelor's degree, there are many students who will want to start earning money right away to support their family, to pay off student loans, or simply because they aren't interested in graduate school at that time. And that's totally fine and normal. But if a student is able to pursue graduate school immediately after getting a bachelor's degree, this has the great advantage of the math and engineering concepts learned as an undergraduate still being fresh in the student's mind. If someone waits a few years before beginning a graduate program, they will need to spend some time relearning a lot of that material. But there are some possible advantages to waiting a few years before applying to graduate school too. For example, if you enter the workforce after receiving a bachelor's degree and find a job that you love that doesn't require a master's degree, well, you saved yourself a couple years of schooling that you didn't need and made money while doing so. Another possible advantage to delaying grad school until you already have a job is that your company actually may pay your tuition to attend school, which could save many thousands of dollars. When selecting a graduate school to apply to, some of the important factors to pay attention to are the university's location, the cost of tuition, the prestige of the university, what research is currently being conducted at that university, and whether you are pursuing a master's degree or a PhD. For example, if a student wants to pursue just a master's degree, most of their time will be spent in the classroom and the research capabilities of the university might not be that important compared to the cost and location. Some graduate programs only will offer a master's degree, which is the case for my very own mechanical engineering department at Cal Poly Pomona. If a student is accepted to a university that offers both master's degrees and PhDs, they usually need to indicate which degree they want to pursue when applying. 
However, if a student enters as a master's student, it may be possible to change uh, to become a PhD student after the first year or two, since both the master's and PhD programs consist of mostly coursework in the early stages. This actually happened to me. I entered UC Irvine as a master's student, but at the end of my first year, I had a talk with my advisor and ultimately I decided to pursue a PhD because I wanted to have a shot at becoming a professor at a university one day. On the flip side, if a student enters as a PhD student, but later decides they are no longer interested in completing the work necessary for a PhD, usually they can stop and leave the university with a master's degree by writing up a master's thesis from the research they've already completed. Many PhD students get a few years into their degree program and realize you know, they just don't enjoy conducting research or realize they don't need a PhD for whatever job they're really interested in. When this happens, it can be a frustrating experience for the faculty advisor because some time and resources have already been invested in that student in the hope they will become productive toward the end of the PhD program. When deciding whether to apply to a graduate school as a master's student or a PhD student, keep in mind that this decision may impact whether the student actually gets accepted into the graduate program. Now, typically, graduate students need a lot of oversight from their advisors when conducting research during their first couple years. Not only do students need to become familiar with high-level concepts and new technologies, but they also have to be trained on the fundamentals of conducting effective research and writing peer-reviewed journal articles, which is how scientific results are shared with the larger academic community. Graduate students become far more productive and require much less oversight in their final years of graduate school because they now have a lot of experience conducting research and writing journal articles. Additionally, students will build momentum as one research project can lead to many follow-up projects and future collaborations. It took me about three years to publish my first journal article as a PhD student, but by the time I received my PhD, I was engaged in multiple projects simultaneously and was publishing at least one journal article per year. Since graduate students only become really productive after a few years of experience, graduate programs may prefer to admit a PhD student over a master's student. Remember, it's graduate students who often are the people who are actually conducting most of the research while the advisor has more of a supervisory role. Why should an advisor and the university invest a lot of time and effort into a student if there's no large payoff in the end. The last topic I'll talk about today is about finding a faculty advisor, which can be a little tricky and may require a bit of work. When applying to PhD programs, students should spend some time reviewing the research focus of individual faculty members in those programs. Information about Faculty members' research interests usually can be found on their own personal websites or on the graduate program's website. If a student finds a faculty member whose research seems interesting, they can try to contact the faculty member and ask about whether they are taking on new PhD students at that time. If the faculty member is looking for new PhD students, the next step would be to set up a meeting to get a feel for what that faculty member is like and to discuss research opportunities. It also can be helpful to talk with PhD students who are currently being advised by that faculty member. Some items that are useful to know are, how many hours per week are PhD students typically expected to work in that advisor's lab? It's common for students to be expected to work 40 or more hours per week doing research. Another item that's useful to know is whether the advisor is responsive and easy to access, or is the advisor difficult to reach and rarely in the lab? An unresponsive advisor can sometimes be frustrating when you need feedback about a project before that project can proceed further. It's also important to know what the faculty member's expectations are for publishing first author journal articles. Journal articles are incredibly important for PhD students because they're evidence that you know how to conduct research and you can defend your work to peers. In many disciplines, 
having your name listed first in a journal article, which is called being a first author, is more impressive than being listed after the first author, although this convention may vary between different disciplines. Now, even if a student has done amazing research while earning a PhD, if a student finishes graduate school with no first author journal articles, the student's resume will look somewhat incomplete when searching for a job. The popularity of the journal where the article is published also can be very important. Each journal has something called a impact factor, which is a metric related to the number of times articles from that journal are cited recently. In general, the higher the impact factor, the more prestigious the journal. Related to the faculty member's expectations for publishing first author journal articles is how many years does it take for a typical student working under that advisor to get a PhD? The number of years can vary significantly between advisors and may be tied to certain requirements they have. When I was a PhD student, my advisor had a rule that in order for me to graduate, I must have at least five journal articles, most of which are first author. Now that's a lot of work, but even though that requirement meant that I would take more time to graduate, it put me in a much stronger position to find a job after leaving graduate school. Another potential question to ask is, how frequently do PhD students get to go to conferences to present their work? It's important for students to get a lot of practice defending their work in a public forum, like a conference, and attending conferences also exposes students to cutting-edge research from around the world. The final item that I'll mention here can be a little delicate, but it's very important, and it's related to funding. Advisors spend a lot of time writing grant proposals to try to secure funding to pay for equipment, part of their own salary, and the salary of those working underneath them the graduate students and other researchers. Unfortunately, sometimes funding dries up when grants end and the advisor is unable to secure new funding. When this happens, PhD students often can still be supported by becoming teaching assistants, but this leaves less time for conducting research and may ultimately delay graduation. Some advisors will completely support PhD students for a limited time, but the students will be expected to apply for grants to support themselves, at least partially, during most of their time as a PhD student. Like most things in life involving money, inquiring about funding should be done in a careful and tactful manner. So overall, as a potential PhD student interacts with the faculty member and the people working underneath the faculty member, that potential student should constantly be asking themselves, can I imagine working underneath this person for at least four years? Now, PhD students dedicate half a decade of their lives to pursuing a PhD. It might as well be with someone who they feel comfortable with. In my own case, I got very lucky that I found an advisor who cared a lot about my interests and was overall very supportive. It's been over a decade since I received my PhD, but I still keep in touch with my former advisor, occasionally having a chat, occasionally having dinner, and he's become a lifelong friend. Again, I consider myself to be very lucky to have had him as an advisor. All right, that's all for today. I hope this episode has given you a greater perspective on what to expect in graduate school. In a future episode, I will try to interview some students who are currently in graduate school and who can give firsthand accounts of their experiences while those memories are still fresh in their minds. If you're enjoying this podcast, there are a few ways to support it. You can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Spotify, and many others. You can rate the podcast and leave comments on whatever app you use to listen to the podcast. And finally, you can help spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends and family and anyone else you think could benefit from this podcast. If you have any comments about the episode, feel free to email me at tesepodcast at gmail.com and I will place the email address in the show notes. 
I'll personally read each email and try my best to respond to them all. Goodbye for now.